It's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Timothy Weber, BDS, BSC, graduated in 1997 and purchased his first practice two years later. He was quick to embrace consumer advertising, at that time only just legalized, tooth whitening and clear liner therapy also only just became available in the UK, using contacts practicing in other countries. Tim incorporated practicing models unusual in the UK to build a $1 million single principal practice. More recently, he has expanded his business, growing his team, and bringing in additional dentists. His business was left heavily exposed to the debt incurred in expansion when shut down by the UK regulators in their COVID-19 response at the end of uh, last March. Tim talks about how he brought his practice back to profit. Uh, Tim, how are you doing today? Yeah, good, thank you. We've just finished work this afternoon. It's uh, about five o'clock in the afternoon here. Well, I got I got to start. Uh, sorry, the, the first question I got to ask is everybody um, wants me to ask every dentist I interview. Would you take the COVID vaccine today? You yourself? I've had I've had my first dose of the Pfizer COVID vaccine. I had it two weeks ago. I, I take the second second dose uh, in like a shot. No problem. So um, I, I'm kind of surprised there's a lot of dentists, there's a, there's a lot of people who don't want to take the vaccine. In fact, in, um, in Phoenix, where I'm at, a third of the frontline workers in nursing homes don't want to take the vaccine. Uh, my staff, um, only three of us have taken it and the rest all want to wait. But what's crazy is my 82-year-old mother wants to see how it goes for a while. Um, why, why did you not, uh, are you seeing that in the UK? Is there much backlash to taking the vaccine uh no nowhere near as much as there is in some countries so uh we were quick out of the blocks in terms of giving the vaccine here uh and we've in the uk we've already immunized about 10 million of the population with the first dose um so in a population of roughly 60 million that's a really good proportion now it's going well there are some nervous nervous people there are some anti-vaxxers that are fundamental fundamentally anti-vax and there are some people who are just very very nervous about a new a new and as they consider untested drug but i i think they're they're the minority um and uh, i don't think it's going to significantly hold up the rollout out of the vaccination program in the uk i think the uh so certainly in my practice so i've got a team of about 20 uh, and I think um, I think we're all either have had it or booked to have it in the next week. So it's going going well here. Um, I, I do wonder why people are so nervous. Um, I think the more informed you are about about the whole sort of drug development industry, more perhaps the more relaxed you are about it. Um, my wife is in drug development. She works for a pharmaceutical company and uh, manages clinical trials for for a living. And uh, so and I, I, I spent the last 20 years hearing about clinical trials and understanding the rigor they go to, the, the, lengths, the lengths they go to to make sure things are right. And uh, I put my hands in there, put my, my life in their hands anytime. I think they, the, the physicians who are doing these clinical trials, they know what they're doing. And I, I, I can't understand why you wouldn't trust them. Well, you know, when an anti-vaxxer says, how can we trust a vaccine that was only made in nine months? I always say, well, you were made in nine months and they let you walk around unsupervised and you weren't made by scientists. You were made in the back of some pickup truck. So uh, I, uh, they, they hold these vaccines to a different standard. But uh, my gosh, so um, we keep hearing in the United States about these um, this UK variant. And then we hear there's one from Brazil and there's some from Africa. Any update on that or these variants uh, concerning you or anything um, we should know? Yeah, if, if I'm honest, a little bit, yes. So the, the research that we've got to date in the UK seems to suggest that the new variant is no more dangerous in terms of the hospitalization rates, which in the UK is, is you know, one of the key indicators the government's using to, to lock down here is how full the hospitals are. I think uh, politically, it would be uh, crippling to any uh, British government to have the hospitals overrun and unable to cope because the, the, most of the hospitals in this country are, are run by the government. So if they can't cope, it, it looks so bad for the government, it's electoral suicide. So I think uh, the number one concern the government has is are the hospitals able to cope? So hospitalization rates uh, from COVID sufferers is a massive issue. And it would appear that the, the new variant that, that seems to have been identified 
in the UK seems to have mutated here, probably mutated here. We know it here as the Kent variant because it was first uh, identified many numbers in the county of Kent in England. Um, it seems to be no more dangerous in terms of hospitalization or of death, however, significantly more infectious. So in terms of how long you have to be in contact with another COVID sufferer or with a COVID sufferer uh, in order to catch the infection seems to be um, seems to be significantly reduced. So the contact time or maybe the contact proximity is reduced. Um, that seems to be driving the spike in COVID that we had here around about Christmas time and the hospitals are still full from that. Um, that seems to be driving that. That's a concern. Um, from, from my perspective as a dentist, my concern is that um, the PPE we have, or the protocols we have to control infection and protect our staff and patients, um, those, th those protocols, that PPE was designed and, and has, has had sort of six, year, six months of, um, of, of testing now in the field with the previous uh, uh, COVID strains that, that, that we got used to. Um, but who knows where, whether the PPE we're using, who knows whether the, um, the, 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 the protocols we have of, of, uh, of social distancing, of separation of our patients in practice, who knows whether that's sufficient to, to prevent um, transmission. Um, that is a concern to us. Um, I think it should be a concern to anyone who works works in healthcare. You know, if you're a doctor or a nurse, or if you're a carer, uh, if the virus is a lot more infectious, uh, it, it, are the the protocols you've been working with for six months that made you feel safe? Are they are they up to the job anymore? You know, when you talk about the uh, national health services, you know, if the hospitals were overrun, it would make them look bad and all that kind of stuff. Um, I always felt the United, the United Kingdom was um, a decade or more ahead of the United States in, the, in that regard. When I got out of school in 87, and first time I lectured for the uh, Royal College of Surgeons of England, I mean, everyone was an NHS provider. And they were, and the the complaining was loud and loud and loud, and um, and now thirty years later, um, it's down to only a quarter are providers. And I saw, I see the same thing happening in the United States, where the insurance companies just keep lowering and lowering and lowering the fee until um, it seemed like the lesson learned from the NHS is that until you absolutely can't make any money and you'll absolutely go bankrupt, uh, the dentist will finally get off the stairway. I mean, he just keeps walking down the stairway and he has to fall into the hot lava before he realizes, okay, I got to turn around and go the other way. Um, do, do you see that same trend where um, the NHS fees just, uh, you, you can't do dentistry like you would do on your children, on your patients, so you can't do it? Absolutely, absolutely. So you're, are you familiar with the analogy of the, cro the frog in the pan? So it's a rather cruel analogy where, uh, if you uh, put a, a little frog in a pan and put it on your stove and warm the stove up and keep warming it, eventually you'll boil that frog to death. Um, whereas if you throw a frog in a hot pan of water, the frog jumps out straight away. So we're finding that in this country. So that many of the older dentists who, who grew up with the National Health Service and, and for the first 10 years of their working lives, the National Health Service earned them a good living. They're still there. They're the frog in the pan that's going to boil. And the younger dentists who left dental school and tried to make it work fairly soon realized it was never going to work and they've jumped out of the pan. So in this country, the, the uh, and dentists who are working for the NHS fall largely into two categories. So the older dentists who are near enough to retirement that they, uh, they can't see the point in rocking the boat. Uh, and uh, and, and, and you know, it's only a little bit worse this year than last year. So I'll just stick with it until I retire. And then we have a um, significant number of, of overseas graduated dentists who trained in other countries and uh, come to the UK to work. And, and, and they probably make up a, a good proportion of the NHS workforce now. I would say that a lot of the younger British qualified dentists have, have left the National Health Service. And, and explain, I mean, a lot of people talk about how they would um, uh, reform the NHS for dentistry. But I mean, um, just um, the thing that blows my mind is when I go to like, the three three of the greatest cities that ever existed. I mean, London, Paris, Tokyo, and they're just amazing cities. You 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 have to go see them, and then you find out that the 
the dentists in those cities are reimbursed only $100 U.S. for a molar root canal. And I was sitting there in, in um, Tokyo podcasting, and I said, well, my gosh, land here is a million dollars a square meter. How the hell do you do a root canal for $100? And he goes, he goes well, you, you can't. You have to... Um, say the tooth needs extracted and then do a, an implant because they don't cover the fees for implants and orthodontics. So clear aligners and implants is going crazy because third-party insurers aren't controlling your price. And if you, I mean, a uh, root canal in America, I mean, um, my gosh, it's 650 would be the lowest and the specialist charge 1200 I mean, if you said, I'm only going to give you $100 for a root canal in the United States, there wouldn't be any. How does London, Paris, and Tokyo, what's going on in their mind at the NHS to think that you're going to get a molar root canal for one Benjamin? But the, the payers are not in the slightest bit interested in uh, the standard of living or even the survival, the business survival of the dentist. That's not of their concern. But, you know, they're interested in getting value for money for their for their payers, whether the, the payer is the government, whether the payer is an insurance uh, organization. They're looking at, at, at value for money if you're a government or profit if you're an insurance organization. They're not, not interested in the dentist. And they, they, they largely know that if one dentist says they can't do it, another one will be along and try. Um, I think the only shame is that in many jurisdictions, the, this has resulted in a reduction in quality. So dentists who feel that for whatever reason they can't work outside of um, insurance provision or in this country, national health service provision, um, many dentists feel that they, 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 they can't work outside of that and, um, and they can't spend a, a, an hour and a half doing a root canal. So they either have to uh, recommend the removal of the tooth or they have to do a partial root canal and hope that's enough, which is uh, a shame at best. You may even say it's unethical, um, but it's, yeah, it's, just, it's a very embarrassing, really, that dentists are put in the position of having to make decisions like that. Well, and that, that's what I got to tell the kids. A lot, a lot of these kids right now are, are coming out and they're working for uh, a corporate or they're working for uh, some dentist. And they're on Dental Town, and they they say they're um, they're they're stressed about what they have to do, and it, they shouldn't be stressed. It's real easy. Treat other people like you want to be treated. And you didn't go to school eight nine years to sit there and do low quality dentistry. Just keep doing the dentistry of how you'd want it done on yourself. And once you can't do that, something's wrong, and you can't be a part of it. You have to. Um, change it. Um, so, you know, when, when I look at this COVID vaccine, um, my gosh, I mean, uh, the COVID virus, we're almost coming up on a year. And, um, you know, Asia, they got to play with this in 2012. So this is their second rodeo. And in Africa, they, they played with Ebola virus two or three times. And, and the United States um, and the United Kingdom, you know, they, they haven't had a pandemic for a century. And I'm sure the next one, There'll be a lot of lessons learned on this time that will apply last uh, for the next one. But how do you think the UK handled uh, the pandemic in regards to uh, regulating your dental office? Um, they closed down our dental office here in um, Arizona for two months. Um, how did it go? And what do you th what lessons do you learn? Uh, what, what do you think they did right? And and uh, what do you think they did wrong? Which they'll probably do differently for the next pandemic. Uh so I, I think so I and most other practices in the UK were closed down at the end of March. Um, what went wrong was it was entirely unclear who had the say-so, who had the right, who had the, the, um, the obligation to tell dentists whether to work or not. Um, it was so, so unclear. Dentists argued amongst themselves. Uh, lawyers argued amongst themselves. And in the meantime, dentists were frightened and just closed. Um, it took from the end of March till, till the end of May uh, to work out that the uh, chief dental officer of, U of the UK, who's a, uh, a government appointment and, regu and um, regulates, but um, uh, uh, effectively runs the, the National Health Service provision of, of dentistry, that the chief dental officer's uh, uh, letter to dentists telling them to close their practices and, and not see anyone, that was not uh, enforceable for private practice. 
it took till the end of May to really make that clear. And uh, and so then at the end of May, private practices started to look at um, how they were regulated, uh, who uh, who they could get insurance with, um, what what um, what risk assessments they needed to make, what uh, protocols they had to follow to open safely. And at the beginning of June, the first private practices started reopening. Uh, and then by July, a uh, really significant number of, of practices were open again in the UK. Uh, and although uh, our government has had subsequent shutdowns where they closed hospitals, uh, sorry, not hospitals, uh, they closed um, hotels and um, uh, entertainment provision, pubs and bars and restaurants and uh, non-essential shops, and most offices are, are closed and people working from home only. Um, although at the moment we've got significant travel restrictions in the UK, dentists are now uh, allowed to work and, and it's, it's, we've got written support that um, the government uh, supports healthcare provision. They don't want healthcare provision to stop. Uh, if if the, the practice owners make an adequate risk assessment and are able to provide a safe service, then they're encouraged to do so. I think that there's a big difference now to how it was at the beginning of the pandemic. And I, I think if, the, if, if another significant um, healthcare pandemic um, strikes in the next 20 years, I think that will be remembered. And I think our dentists and, and uh, uh, general um, medical practitioners will know where they stand and what they need to do. My suspicion is if the next pandemic comes in 100 years, all this will be forgotten like last time. <laughs> so, uh, my gosh, I, I think the uh, um, three most uh, powerful women that uh, exist in dentistry today is uh, Dr. Marjorie Taylor, the Chief Dental Officer for Scotland, Professor Cynthia Pine, and Professor Sarah Haley, the Chief Dental Officer for England. Uh, I bet this has been one hell of a miserable year for them, huh? Have they, uh... <laughs> yeah, I, you wouldn't want to swap with them. You know, they, they, when they took the job on, this is not the sort of thing that they thought they'd be doing. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is the, uh, I would not want to be, uh, I would not want to be uh, living with uh, someone who's um, under that much uh, stress. So, um, you know, we learned a lot from the um, AIDS pandemic that went on to, um, you know, that, that broke out in 1979 and dentistry had to modify and wear gloves and all this stuff like that. And that, that pandemic went on to still kill 36 million people, and I'm so glad that HIV is the next target um, with these uh, vaccine companies. Um, but we learned a lesson, a lot of lessons from HIV for um, the coronavirus. Where do you think um, HIV covered our bases for COVID-19? And where do you think it was a little weak? And what do you, what, what lessons did you learn in this pandemic that, that you'll always do the rest of your life, that you didn't have yeah, for I HIV? Yeah, some great questions there. So, so to go through them, I think uh, HIV is clearly blood-borne transmission. Um, uh, Respiratory-borne is entirely different. And I think one of the things that was uh, a shock to the dental profession when we looked at returning to work last summer uh, was that many of the protocols that we have, we've been taught at dental school and, and then sort of uh, updated with, with um, continuous professional development in the meantime, has been around preventing bloodborne transmission. So respiratory borne transmission, we've largely brushed under the carpet. Um, so I, I think most dentists just accepted that they'd be exposed to the common flu virus and, and, and TB. And uh, you know, we're immunized against TB and, and some of us are immunized against the, the, uh, the flu. Um, and many of us just, just build up a sort of a lifetime, a lifetime sort of immunity. I think if you ask most dentists, I'd be amazed if many of them get severe flu um, because our occupational exposure has been, been so high. And so we've been fairly blasé, probably falsely so, about uh, respiratory borne transmission. And we've been overly, overly uh, aware of and, um, and, and most of our protocols are entirely written around uh, preventing blood borne transmission. And suddenly along comes COVID and it changes all that. Uh, and, and that's been a shock to us. Um, it, it, a year ago, no one ever spoke about aerosol generating procedures. I mean, aerosol, I mean, so what, you know, so it, it wasn't a big thing. And, uh, and all last summer, all I heard of every second sentence was aerosol generating procedure, AGP, AGP, was a big, big topic of conversation. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's completely overtaken how we run our practices and, and, and how we guard against this. Um, 
so as, as a profession, we're much, much more aware of aerosol-borne transmission. Um, the way we ventilate our practices, the way we, we, we uh, um, think, the way we're even thinking about cross infection control is very different. And I think some of that will stay. Um, I think some aspects of it, um, I, I think, will, will, will die. I think most surgeons will be very pleased not to have to wear respirators or uh, um, FFP3 uh, masks um, uh, and sort of whole head hoods and so on. I, I think most of us would be very happy to say goodbye to those. Um, but some of the more general cross-infection control processes, the general wearing of masks in healthcare settings, I think things like that are likely to stay. You were shut down, and you you were you had a lot of leverage, and I, I'm I'm worried about the um, uh, the stock market. I can't believe how many de- dentists last night an endodontist was talking to me, and, and he was telling me how um, you know last year was a bad year, but he didn't care because he's making so much money in the stock market. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, uh, uh, that's another, uh, that's another, that's a whole nother deal. I mean, um, I, you know, that, that, that's, I've lived through four stock market uh, corrections. And I think that this one uh, could be the ugliest one. The ugliest one was when I graduated in 1980, but, but back to your dental office, um, how did you adapt? You, you, you found yourself leveraged to build this amazing million dollar practice. And then um, the, the government turns off your cash flow machine and shuts you down. Um, how is it getting back up? And have you resumed your pre pandemic levels? So, so, yeah, lots of questions there. So the first thing was panic stations. So March of last year, as you say, suddenly the income stream, we're a free per item practice. So the money that comes in at the end of every, uh, the, the IC coming in at the end of every month, zero, a lot of outgoings still there. So debts to repay, um, staff costs, uh, in, in rental and lease fees, um, a, lot of, a lot of concerns. So I, I spent the... First two weeks of our lockdown on the phone to my uh, uh, creditors, which was a, was not a lot of fun. So renegotiating payments, uh, uh, buying buying time with the banks, um, buying time with suppliers, uh, re- renegotiating a lot of contracts I had, um, uh, laying off staff either either temporarily or or, or permanently. Um, looking at what help the our government was making available. So I, I spent two weeks with virtually no sleep, uh, spending all the hours of the day working out how to uh, to rescue the, uh, uh, the, the, the cash flow, cash flow uh, sort of disaster that I could see coming. Um, and then once I'd sort of stemmed the, 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 the bleeding and the sort of the worst of the hemorrhaging was slowed down and we weren't bleeding money out of the practice and we were only sort of seeping, seeping money through a wound, um, it then gave me time to think about how we how we could sort of safely reopen and how we did this. So, what do we do? Um, well, it became clear that uh, we needed to make our patients feel safe. So, when our patients come into the practice, they need to feel safe. Otherwise, they won't be back, and otherwise, they'll scare their friends. Um, so, we need to. The first thing is how do we make it look safe? So, we closed our waiting room. No waiting room, no lounge. Um, we told people we closed our toilets. We actually still have them open, so if people are caught short and you know it's an emergency, they can use them, and we just have to you know um, valet them afterwards. But uh, we told people the toilets were closed. We closed the lounge. We closed the reception, so the reception is closed. Uh, my receptionist now works from home, so I have a receptionist who's working from home. She's got a, a PC logged into our. Um, uh, appointment book. She's taking phone calls from home. She's taking emails from home. So she's safe and at home. She's not seeing patients. She can't catch anything from a patient. And she can't give anything to a patient. Uh, my other receptionist um, was uh, was given a new job description. We had to tell her, you know, I can't have a receptionist at the moment. So I can lay you off, or you can have this new role. And we retrained her in um, in, in 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 biosecurity in COVID security. So basically, she's a She's a bio doorman. She basically guards the front door. The front door is locked. No one comes into that front door or leaves unless, the, unless she knows who it is and what they're doing. So everyone who turns up, we, we, we uh, uh, call all our, our, our patients beforehand and explain the protocol to them. So they turn up on their own. They turn up unaccompanied unless they're children. They come into the, they, 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 they have to wait 
We tell them to arrive exactly at their appointment time. We don't have a lounge. As soon as they arrive, um, uh, my, my doorkeeper lets them in. They, they have to come in wearing a mask. They have to scrub their hands when they come in. They, we take their temperature. Standard protocols, a lot, of, a lot of people are now using. We ask them about their COVID experience. We explain to them some of the symptoms they haven't heard of. Everyone knows you've got a temperature or cough, you might have COVID. But some of the more nuanced uh, symptoms like the running nose, the change of, change of the loss of smell. A lot of people, especially last summer, weren't really aware of that. So we explain that if there's any symptoms or, or raised temperature, we send them home. Assuming they come through that, they then are escorted to the surgery. We don't let anyone walk around the practice on their own. They're escorted to the surgery. In the surgery, they then um, are, are uh, treated, you know, they're, they're, Kept, kept in that room until the end of their treatment and then escorted back out again. So from the minute someone walks in, they feel they're not coming into contact with people uh, that they don't need to. They're not meeting strangers. The people they're dealing with are wearing PPE. Um, the whole protocol is explained beforehand. Um, so the first thing we did is to make people feel as safe as they can be. Um, the next thing we did is to space out our patients. We don't want a waiting room. We don't want people waiting so we allowed more time for disinfection between patients. But that also meant that one patient had left before the next one arrived. And we staggered. So I've got five surgeries. We staggered the arrival time. So we don't have five people turning up at nine o'clock. We have someone turning up at nine and someone at 10 past and someone at 20 past and someone at half past and someone at 22, et cetera. So people are turning up and leaving at different times and they don't meet each other. So that's part of making people feel safe. It also gives us more time to clean the surgeries in between patients. Uh, so that was another part, another sort of thing we did that we felt would, would, would keep us safe, keep our patients safe, and crucially make the patients feel safe. Um, the next thing after that was to put off treatment for people where it really wasn't urgent. You know, if you have a patient come in and a simple glass on them or cement dressing is going to keep them comfortable for a year, we said, look, I can do this quickly and inexpensively. I can dress this tooth. I can keep you going for a year and we can discuss it next year. And hopefully, you know, the world is a bit more normal and, and uh, we can talk about a long-term restoration. And then patients for whom it was clear that they need really, really good complex treatment now to get it right for them. We, we explained to them, right, this is the, the deal. You know, we, we need to do this if you want to keep this tooth or you want to be free of pain or you want your occlusion not to collapse or, you know, you want your retainer not to fail or whatever it is. We need to do this for you now. The only way of doing that safely is uh, initially we were talking about extreme PPE. So the, the, the protective equipment that we were using in the UK um, was, I think, at, at about the most extreme there was in the world. So the PPE that our um, uh, uh, national government health agency, um, Public Health England, the PPE recommendations they put out was based on Ebola care. So it was based on World Health Organization Ebola care. So it was really extreme, extreme PPE. We were using um, uh, uh, the sort of things you saw on the television that, they, that, that the, the um, medics are using in, in uh, um, uh, uh, corona wards in hospitals. So we were using you know, complete plastic body suits. We were using um, respirators, we're using um, P, uh, um, FFP3 masks um, with sort of you know, double gloves and, 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 and the full works. And after an afternoon surgery, you'd have lost, um, lost uh, you know, eight pounds in, in, in weight just from sweating in the kit. Um, so that's what we, we were doing initially to try and um, make our patients feel safe and keep safe ourselves. And then we started to look at, you know, is there a more sensible way of doing this? You know, do we need to do that for everybody? No. Um, and then around about uh, September time, it first became clear that we could access um, instant COVID testing, so lateral flow testing. Um, and lateral flow testing has been revolutionary in my practice. It's allowed us to make the whole place feel more normal. So... Um, Lateral flow tests, uh, I, I would imagine your listeners are all familiar now with what a lateral flow test is. So you collect um, a swab sample from the oropharynx or, and, um, and the nasopharynx, uh, and uh, it's re reliant on, uh, on chemical reactions and gives you 10 to 15 minute um, result. 
Um, so in my practice, my the whole team is tested every week. Uh, so the first working day of the week that a team member is in, they're tested. And any of our uh, patients that come in that are having a procedure that we recognize as being a risk for generating an aerosol or is having a longer procedure. So anyone who's coming in for an hour or longer procedure is, is uh, having a lateral flow test um, uh, in order to establish you know, the, the, the risk of that person uh, passing on uh, uh, passing on COVID, and that has allowed us us to feel more relaxed as a team, and it's allowed our patients to feel more relaxed, um, and it's it's given us sort of a, a bit more of an energetic vibe to the practice, so we don't feel like we're wading through treacle, uh, making headway trying to see patients, um, and that that that's allowed us to be more confident in in uh, offering treatment and providing treatment. Um, and uh, allow, allowed us to return to, uh, to to turning a profit rather than just standing still. So, did you do you um, sell those tests? So, when, when people come in, explain how it come, happens. So, when people come in, you test them to see if they're test positive for COVID nineteen. Exactly, exactly. So, for example, this afternoon uh, I did a crown preparation on uh, 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 a young pharmacist. And I know that to cut a, a crown prep really nicely, I've got to use a ton of water, right? So I don't want to be bumping against that tooth for, for, for half an hour. I want to do a really clean, really nice crown prep. And in order to do that, I use a speeding uh, increasing handpiece on a micromotor, and I use quite a lot of water. And I know that is going to generate an aerosol. Not as much aerosol as a turbine, but it's going to generate an aerosol. And I can't, I can't get away with that. Um, I can't do a really nice crown prep without generating an aerosol. So I want to minimize the risk to everyone involved. So I, I had a COVID test when I got to work this morning. One of my colleagues tested me. My patient uh, had a COVID test. So I don't allow any longer than I normally do for this procedure. So what happens is the patient comes in. They've been told beforehand that we're going to do a COVID test. The whole procedure has been explained remotely um, so that there's, there's no shocks when they come in. They know the procedure and we can sort of walk them through it nice and um, relaxed. Um, so the patient came in, I very briefly explained that we're gonna do the COVID test and what, what follows afterwards. Uh, the, the COVID te a test is a lateral flow, it comes in a little cassette. Um, it's all based on chemical reactions, there's no, there's no electronic components. Um, I collect a swab, um, first of all, from the oropharynx, so I go over the top of the tongue, effectively into the, uh, the top of the pharynx there. Um, it's about a six six inch long swab, and I, I, I go go pretty pretty deep. So the patients do gag; they don't like it. But most of them, have, actually, in this country, a lot of people have already had COVID tests um, already for a variety of reasons. They know what to expect. It does make you gag, but it's not. It doesn't hurt. It just makes you gag. So you collect a collect a swab there, and then I follow up by collecting a nasal nasal swab as well. Again, we're going from the nasopharynx. It's not. We're not looking at the. Um, at the front of the nose there, we're not looking at the, uh, uh, at uh, just a sort of a surface. So we don't just want a little bit of snot off the surface. We want to go with sort of a fairly, fairly deep na nasopharyngeal swab. Um, and it's a good sort of five second swab. So I sort of, you know, put it in and turn it around five times. So 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. We want, we want to make sure we're getting a really good quality uh, sample. So when we test someone, we know, we, we know we've got a, an, a, an accurate result. Um, the, um, uh, the sample is then mixed with a bit of buffer and then is strained through a, through a, a filter in a pipette into the uh, lateral flow cartridge. And the lateral flow cartridge starts to react within two, three minutes. Uh, you, um, for, for those who haven't seen one yet, um, you get a little test reaction um, and that, uh, that gives you a stripe across the cassette that tells you that the... Um, the testing cassette is valid, that the, the chemistry is good, the cassette hasn't been spoilt in some way. Uh, so that tends to react over about five minutes. And then over about the next five minutes, you then start to see if it's a positive uh, reaction to COVID, you start to see a line across it, a little bit like a pregnancy test kit. Um, and uh, after, after 10 minutes, you, you've got a pretty clear line in my experience. After 15 minutes, you're not going to see any difference. So so what I'm doing is, is the, the um, I've started the clock. Um, I, by now, I, I do the test so much that within a minute, I've, I've, I've got the test going. So one minute into the appointment, the test is going. Um, I've got 10 minutes to, to kill. During that 10 minutes, I'm explaining to the patient what we're going to do in their procedure. Um, 
We then get the patient as a precaution to rinse uh, for a minute with a, uh, an iodine mouth rinse. Um, so iodine povate has been shown in studies to reduce the viral load in, um, in uh, saliva and sputum. Um, and so we, we're, patients are rinsing for a minute with that and then they're gargling. Uh, so that's, that's taken them just over a minute. Um, then I'm, I'm explaining the, uh, the procedure to them again. And while I do that, I might put the topical anesthetic in. So I'm, the way I do it, I have topical anesthetic on a cotton wool roll. I pop that into the sulcus at the, uh, the site for the local anesthetic. And I normally leave that in for two minutes anyway. So by now we're about four minutes into the test and um, into the lateral flow test. So by now I can see that the test is, uh, the cartridge is a good one and, and it's, uh, it's going to be a valid test. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and I've explained a lot of the, pro the, the, uh, the procedure the patient's about to undergo. So at that stage, I then clarify that they're giving consent to the whole thing. And, um, and at that stage, I'm starting to see, I've got a first inkling as to whether the, uh, the lateral flow is going to be a positive or negative test. So I can't prove it's going to be negative, but I'll, if it's going to be positive, I can normally start to see something at this stage. Um, if the test looks like it's positive at this stage, I will then immediately um, uh, start a second test. I want to be I want to be sure that we haven't got a faulty test. So I've got um, I'll get a different cartridge out from a different supplier, pop a bit of sample into that one, and get that one reacting as well. So that if it's going to be a positive test, I can tell the patient I'm sure I've done two different tests from two different suppliers, and I'm pretty damn sure that they're positive. If it's looking negative, and it's a crown prep, for example, I might do something relatively uh, low risk. So at that stage, uh, I might um, actually administer the local anesthetic if it's, a, if it's an infiltration, um, or I might stand behind them to take a preoperative alginate. Um, and so by the time all that's said and done, we might be then up to about the 10 minute mark, and I'm pretty clear now whether it's a positive or a negative test. So, so if it's a positive test, um, then I've normally got an idea of that after five minutes, so by then I haven't actually given the local anesthetic or taken a uh, an alginate. So at that stage, we, 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 uh, the patient's got their mask back on. We explain to the patient the consequence of the positive test and what that means in terms of the sort of UK regulation in terms of self-isolation and their responsibilities and what happens next. So I chat them through that. Uh, and then we say, we say goodbye, follow up with a phone call later in the day to make sure that they're following procedure. Um, so far in um, three months, four months of doing this, uh, I've only had three positive tests. Um, of, 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 of asymptomatic patients. We've had some symptomatic patients we've turned away because they had symptoms, but asymptomatic patients have had three, three positive tests. Um, and um, uh, if it's a negative test, which you know the vast majority have been, then by 10 minutes, I can see the test is negative and I'm now more relaxed about the whole procedure. We still need to wear PPE, we still need to all, the, you, know, you can't forget about other infections. It's not like, you know, um, uh, hepatitis B and HIV and, and other things have gone away. We still have to be aware of all the other infections. We can't forget PPE and cross-infection control. But we, we can relax a little bit about the COVID side of things. And we can proceed with the patient's, uh, in this case, uh, crown preparation appointment. And I, I can complete the crown preparation appointment without an undue rush in the normal time I would do to. In my practice, um, I, I tend to take about an hour, whether I'm doing one or two um, one or two teeth, I, I tend to leave an hour. That gives me enough time to uh, explain everything I need to my patient and the whole thing to be unrushed and fairly um, relaxed. Um, and and, and in, in this case, I now am pretty confident that patients are, are negative and, um, and we haven't risked infecting each other that day. So um, we all know uh, 2020, that year was dead on arrival. In fact, I... Um, I don't mean to be a pessimist or anything, but I, I think the decade was dead on arrival. I think 2020 to 2030 <laughs> is dead. Um, and, and I really do. I mean, the, the 10 years after Lehman's Day, um, in 2008, um, um, the Lehman's Day, the stock market crash, that, that was kind of a lost decade. And, and, um, and now we're going through a pandemic and we're about to go through another economic contraction. How does, how does your 2021 look like to you? Do you think um, you, um, what percent down were you for the year for uh, 2020? I mean, we were closed two months. That's, it has to be 16% lower just because you were closed two months. Um, how was 2020 and what are you expecting for 2021? So that's a good question. So I have to say I'm not as pessimistic as you. So uh, so you know, Lehman Brothers was a disaster if you worked in banking. 
um, in the early days. But I, I suspect if you talk to people who work in banking, by the end of that decade, they'd made good on it. Um, so these things can seem like a, a personal tragedy. But you know what? Uh, the 10 years after Lehman Brothers, people were getting married. People were starting practices. People were starting families. People became millionaires. People became billionaires. Uh, people retired with good pensions. There was, there was, you know, there's a lot of things that seem terrible when you're, when you're, you know, a day after Lehman goes to up. But, uh, but I, I wouldn't be so hasty to ride the decade out off. You know, every, every decade has got a, has got a disaster, has got a, you know, something disastrous happens and, and most of us get through it. Um, for the people who were worst affected, it's a disaster. Um, I, I think back to my own grandparents who at the end of World War II, had nothing. So at the beginning of World War II, they were wealthy industrialists, and at the end of World War II, they had the clothes they were standing up in. And um, and you know, it's uh, uh, it can be it, it can seem a catastrophe, but you know what? Um, uh, during the the uh, the the 1950s, you know, my 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 family uh, you know rebuilt their their, their businesses, and uh, 30 years later, they 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 retired with with. Um, with, 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 a, with a, you know, having looking back on a great business career, so I wouldn't be so pessimistic. In terms of me personally, 2020 business-wise was a disaster. So the, the the work we didn't do pretty much equated to my profit margin. So I, I I finished the year without making a profit. I I was glad that I stood still and it hadn't cost me anything. That was I was grateful that I hadn't cost me anything, but I I made no money. And um, this year I'm 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 optimistic. I think we we're learning how to work with COVID. It's not, it's not fun, um, and, uh, but we're working, we're working, we're learning how to do it, and we're working, and we're providing a service, and, and, um, and we're increasing what we can do. And, and you know what, it's brought, if you're working with clear aligners, or you're working with um, lingual braces, incognito, if you're working in, um, in cosmetic improvements, in tooth whitening, and, and uh, veneer, and crown placement, it's, it's, it's good. You know, we, we have a lot of uh, new patient inquiries, all the time because people are fed up of looking at their own faces on Zoom and seeing stuff they don't like about themselves. And so our new patient inquiries are up. Um, our uh, uptake of uh, clear aligners, our uptake of incognito is up. Um, uh, the number of inquiries for, for veneers is up. Um, I, I think some of the, 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 the perhaps routine preventive care, um, if you have a practice that's based on um, on uh, uh, prevention that's based on uh, hygiene services and simple restorative. I think it could be heavy going this year. If you, if you, if you flip your practice and, and look at providing what people want um, and what people are prepared to leave their house for, which is to look good on Zoom, um, then I think there's opportunities. I, I, I'm, I don't think it's going to be my best year ever, but, it, but I'm certainly looking to, to turn a profit this year. And, um, and 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 looking at being flexible about how the business can supply what people are actually prepared to pay for. So the UK has, um, I find it interesting. They, they have thirteen specialties: huh? uh, dental, and maxillofacial radiology, dental public health, endo, oral surgery, oral medicine, oral microbiology. That's the one we don't have. Oral surgery, orthodontics, pediatric, perio, pros, restorative, special care dentistry. Um, are the uh, oral microbiologists doing? Uh, what, what do they think of your in-office testing, and um, um, what, what are their thoughts of all that? So, so the interesting thing is that of, of this list of specialists on on the on the uh, the General Dental Council's register, in reality, many of these don't practice. Uh, or, or, you know, they don't have a viable business practice. Many of these are specialties that are registrable and are um, they reflect the expertise of registrants. Uh, and their training, but these are not, so um, uh, an oral biologist um, uh, registered with the General Dental Council is not providing services to, uh, to, to patients. So you know, it, they, these, these are people who are working in research and so on. So in terms of uh, you know, what does the research community feel about this? So that's interesting. So as it happens, I've got um, patients who, who work in, in um, research, in Work in, uh, in uh, advising go the go government. I've got, I've got patients uh, who just by chance work in, uh, in advising our government, and, and my wife works in clinical trials. So, uh, look, looking at, um, at, at, at what, the, what the current state of thinking is, and it's very hard with COVID to prove anything because everything's so new. Looking at the current state of thinking, um, there are 
two types of tests. There's the PCR uh, test um, uh, and then the lateral flow. So the, the PCR test is, is looking really for, um, for uh, DNA or RNA um, uh, in, in your sample. And so you're looking for the actual uh, presence of, of the, the, the virus in your cells. So that's what you're looking for. Um, and in terms of what that, what that can, can give you, so that's, that's regarded as, as the, the gold standard. And um, uh, it, it is what has been used in the UK to identify the different strains, the different mutations, because in this country, uh, the PCR tests, uh, uh, um, tests for three different bits of, uh, of, of, of genetic coding. And uh, it's when one of those bits of genetic coding wasn't there and two of them were, that they started to, uh, to, to realize there was a mutation going on. So that's regarded as the gold standard. However, it's not particularly great at telling you whether you're infectious today. So uh, the fact that you've got the virus in you doesn't mean you're making the virus, and doesn't mean you're expressing it and therefore infectious. Uh, you also will have some virus in you after your immune system has built up um, a, a response, and you're no longer uh, uh, um, either unwell in any in any way, sort of symptomatic, or indeed infectious anymore. So you can be non-infectious but still test positive with the PCR test. So the lateral flow test is looking at the presence of uh, 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 proteins present on the on the viral case um, in your in your uh, sputum in your uh, in your saliva. So that's what it's looking for, which is, is actually far more valid in terms of if as a dentist, you want to know whether your patient is, is infectious. Um, and, um, and, and, and so that's a more of a real time. So, so if I test a patient with my, 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 my lateral flow test, then I'm looking at, is this patient expressing virus in their mucosa today? Are they, is it present in their sputum? Is it present in their saliva? When I generate an aerosol, is that, is that virus going to kick up into the room and in effect either another patient or another member of staff or myself? So that's what I'm looking for. It's not brilliant at telling me whether this person in front of me has the virus in them. And that is why the lateral flow test has got a bit of a bad name in terms of telling us whether a person being tested is, uh, is COVID positive. Um, because it's it's not brilliant at telling you is is the is the is the COVID in this person. It's better at telling you is this person expressing COVID in their saliva or their their sputum. Um, and so that's where this distinction has come from. If you look at the 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 for what to say to use a layman's expression, the accuracy of the test. So if you have a, a sample, if you generate a sample that you know is positive for the for COVID, if you have a, if you artificially make a sample. And then, and then test the variety of lateral flow tests. The sort of majority of the lateral flow tests that are now commercially available are, are very good, very good. So 97, 98, 99, depending on which one you buy, uh, percent at uh, 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 picking up um, there's, there's COVID in the sample. They're very, very accurate at picking up COVID in the sample. What they're not great at is telling you whether the patient has COVID. So I could test someone with my lateral flow today. They're negative. I do their crown prep. They could develop COVID in two days because they already have the virus. I haven't been, I, I, I tell my patients, you know, the fact you're negative does not give you free reign now to, to, um, uh, to move around like, you're, like you've got no risk to anyone. It's only really valid today. And that's the important thing. So in terms of the, the, you know, the validity of the testing, the lateral flow testing is very specifically um, relevant to, is the person that I'm about to treat infectious now? It's not good at telling you, is this person got COVID at all? Are they likely to develop COVID and pass it on to someone else in two days, three days, a week's time? Uh, and and uh, lateral flow tests have been used extensively in mass testing uh, and have got a bit of a bad name. Uh, but I'm not using them to tell, have you got COVID to uh, at all? I'm telling, I'm using it, as I said, to determine, is the person infectious now? Wow, that's a uh, that's a mouth to chew on. Um, I um, loved reading that article. Uh, SARS uh, COVID two positivity in asymptomatic uh, screen dental patients uh, that was published by um, uh, uh, David Conway, professor of dental public health in Glasgow. Um, so, do you? Um, so, 
is your business um kind of getting back to normal right now? I mean, are you were were you busy this week? Yes. So my my business is now limited by supply rather than demand. So I've got more patients coming in than I can than I can look after. I'm recruiting. Um, I've got a uh, a new nurse starting on Friday. I've got a new dentist starting in um uh four weeks um so we're we're yeah we're we're laying on more supply because the demand's there well that that's a great problem to be in um when you uh do orthodontics um you know that that's especially in the u k uh, it's one of the uh uh thirteen specialties um do yeah. does the does the orthodontic when, when you do orthodontics is the orthodontist as good with that as say when you do molar endo, the endodontist does it or pull it to the oral surgeon or is there, um, is it, is there kind of any um, competitive animal spirits between general dentists doing ortho and uh, orthodontists especially? Absolutely. There's always a bit of a rub, rub there. Um, I think it, it, the analogy with the endo is that um, you could uh, look at um, the rage graph of an upper central incisor that's been traumatized, but not fractured and has lost vitality. And it's got a really nice root anatomy. And as a general dentist, you might think if I take my time over this and follow the protocol that I learned at dental school and I use all the right right materials along the way and allow my time, I could get a great result for this patient. And, And as a general dentist, most of the time you're absolutely right. But then you could have something more complicated. You could have a central incisor with lateral canals, um, or you could have a, in a retreatment case, you could have a, 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 a tooth that, that, uh, that died immature with an open apex. You could have a variety of complications of a, of a, central, of a traumatized central incisor. You could have uh, a, a lower incisor with, with two or three canals. You could have a, um, an upper, an upper um, premolar with uh, two or three canals. You could have a multi, multi-rooted molar, in which case uh, your, your specialist is, is, is probably um, gonna, gonna, gonna be who, who you want your patients to see. So I work with an endodontist, and um, and whenever I see something that that looks a little in a non-standard, they're straight to see the endodontist. Um, similarly, uh, there's a lot of orthodontic cases where a general dentist with training and experience can do a great job. A classic scenario would be relapse cases. So in this in this country, we have a lot of adults who were provided with uh, uh, fixed appliances as teenagers and didn't wear retainers. And now they're 30 and they're looking at themselves on Zoom and they can see they're crowding and they can see, they see the problems of not having worn their retainers. Many of them know that they were given retainers and gave up on them and, um, and they want to come and have it fixed. And, uh, and, and I think um, uh, a, a general dentist with experience, I've been doing Invisalign for 15 years. Uh, I've, I've been doing fixed appliances for 20 years. Uh, and I, I think I can do a great job of looking someone like, after someone like that. But then at the weekend, we did a consult for a young girl who's skeletal class two. And um, she's the whole unit class two in the canines. And she needs, she needs something altogether more complicated. So uh, a patient like that, and we, we're going to refer her to a specialist orthodontist. She's likely to need surgery. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't pretend I'm going to do a great job of looking after her like that. It's, it's, it's about making a professional decision based on your own competence. You know, um, having lectured around the world in 50 countries, I, I've been amazed, at like, like, like um, how a country like Hong Kong can be so progressive, but when it comes to dentist advertising, no way. And uh, Romania, my God, they'll take your license away if you advertise. And my history of the UK was, I mean, when, when bleaching came out, when when at home bleaching came out, I mean, my God, the the uh, British Dental Association fought that like 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 an enemy, and so it kind of surprised me to see the do it yourself orthodontics uh, smiles drug club uh, taking off in the UK with multiple locations, and I think that's bringing the orthodontist and the dentist together. I mean, the old joke, your enemy's enemy is your friend. <laughs> the orthodontist used to think they were competing with the general dentist, but now they're competing it with Wall Street. So they, they need everybody on the same team. But how is the do-it-yourself orthodontic market um, doing in the UK? And how has it changed your business model on price, terms, features, anything like that? That's a really good question. So you know what? So I work in Nottingham, which is right in the, in the heart of, the, of England. It's right. If you draw a pin in the middle of England, that's where I am. 
And uh, it's, it's, it's a relatively small town. And we had a Smiles Club Direct here uh, last year, and they were doing, you know, direct to the public um, uh, 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 clear aligner therapy. And um, interestingly, the, um, the COVID shutdown last, last year closed them down. So they, 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 they closed and they haven't reopened. They, they've shut that store. Um, and I, I think because uh, they occupied a sort of very much gray area, they weren't healthcare. Um, uh, they were unable to get insurance to cover what they were doing, is my understanding. Um, they had to sort of see themselves more like a beautician, I guess. And the beauticians have been closed for pretty much a year here now, and that scared them off. Um, so for me, that's that's been a good thing. Um, uh, uh, they were they were making inroads into pricing, so I think the prices of clear aligner therapy had been coming down, um, and uh, I think there had started to become a divide based more on service. So there was a, there was some there were a section of of, uh, of the population who were entirely price driven and and would go down to sort of you know direct uh, direct um, direct to the lab sort of uh, service, uh, and then there was a section who were more driven on on um, uh, on service or 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 based around a concern about uh, insurance or efficacy, um, and they would they would see a dentist. Um, uh, I think the the scare which the uh, the pandemic has, has has had on that market um, may take a while for the clear aligner guys to come back in into uh, into 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 the mainstream. I think they've. Um, they, 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 in terms of getting getting um, protocols up, in terms of getting insurance, in terms of demonstrating to their patients that they're doing the right thing, it's going to take them longer to get going. But, you know, the only secret to lower prices is lower cost. And the low-cost airlines, uh, like Southwest Airlines, they pioneered, you know, they got rid of uh, uh, meals and and scheduling a seat, and they, they, they made a lot of changes so they can have lower costs. And it sounds like these uh, do-it-yourself ortho clubs, um, they, they're just going to operate on scanning and the remote delivery of clear aligners. Um, did, is there anything in that business model that you um, are looking at where you think, uh, yeah, I should do that too? Uh, like, are you doing the oral scanning? Would you ever consider, um, you know, remote delivery of clear aligners? Or would you ever consider... Um, giving them, you know, all their aligners for the whole case up front, or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, so that's very interesting. So we learned when we were closed in uh, April, May of last year that those of our patients who were wearing Invisalign were much easier to manage. So using uh, Zoom or, you know, some other sim similar format, we could look at their fit of their aligners on screen. We could interview them as to how their experience was going, uh, we could uh, mail out new aligners to them. Um, we could ask them about uh, in the tight contacts. We could get them to floss in front of the Zoom and we could sort of get some sort of idea as to where they might have tight contacts. Um, and uh, so we, we had uh, quite a lot of our Invisalign patients we were driving forward during the, during the lockdown. Um, we were mailing aligners out. We were uh, able to, as long as they didn't need significant IPR, um, we were able to keep them going, whereas obviously all the all the patients with fixed appliances that oh that was stress. Patients who had trouble with fixed appliances with brackets that were loose and so on that was a big stress, um, and it worried us worried us quite a lot. So we we did learn we could remotely manage uh, clear aligners, and so now we although we are, we are seeing patients face to face, we are we have significantly extended the time between appointments for our, our clear um, aligner patients. Um, we're looking at you know, how, how can we bring together all the IPR so that that happens um, in fewer appointments so they need less visits. And yeah, that, that, that does show some promise to the future as a way of bringing down costs. But I think the big way in which the um, direct-to-consumer marketing uh, and scanning only service that you allude to has, has cut down on, on price is, is also removing Obligation. So dentists are always worried that what they're doing is is uh, is not going to cause a dental health problem. So we see a patient for an aligner review. We see calculus. We talk to the patient about that. We see caries. We talk to the patient about that. We feel an obligation to fix their general dental problems. If you don't feel any of those obligations at all, if you wash your hands of any responsibility for someone's oral health, 
and they and it, it just expect a disclaimer they've signed to uh, to uh, to to look after that. Of course, you can cut your price down. You can you can uh, you know, if all you're doing is scanning and delivering aligners, and the patient signed a waiver. Um, it's it, 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 you you can drive the price right down. However, uh, I, I think the there's a significant chance that there'll be some some future sort of class actions against. Uh, against clear aligner providers where you can show that the provision of aligners has caused the same problem in a significant number of people. And um, that, that, yeah, I, I don't know how, how their lawyers are looking at that, but I wouldn't fancy to be in their shoes because as a dentist, whenever you see a clear aligner patient, you're looking at more than just does this aligner fit? Are the teeth tracking in it? Do I need to do some IPR? Um, there's a lot more to it. Um, uh, I... I, I Yes, we've learned some lessons off them. We're faster at scanning now. We're, we've cut down the number of appointments we do with them. We do more remote reviews. We do more remote consults. Um, I don't mind as much now doing a, 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 a consult at 8 p.m. in the evening because I can do it from my study at home. I don't need to do it from my practice. Um, uh, I don't need to be paying a nurse while I'm doing the uh, doing the review. I can be, you know, my costs are limited. I can I can sit in my in my office on my on my own with, with limited costs. Um, I can have I can have a, an orthodontic therapist in my surgery uh, uh, changing people's aligners, changing people's ortho wires while I'm in, in an office, which costs me a lot less to run doing reviews and consults. So yes, we've learned from the pandemic in terms of what we can do remotely. Yes, we've learned from the direct consumer suppliers in terms of you know, can we can we cut down the appointment times? But in terms of our obligation, that isn't going away. Um, and in a, in a way, that that's good. You know, that that divides us from the um, from the direct to consumer people. It, it'll always, always, always make make us um, one 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 step ahead in terms of what we're providing. All right. Well, on that note, um, I can't believe how fast the time went, but man, it was just an honor to hear from you. And uh, thanks for uh, sticking up the fight for this pandemic and all that you're doing for dentistry. And it was just an honor to podcast you. That's great speaking to you too. I wish you a very good day. And, and all your listeners, I hope uh, you uh, pick up and move on and 2021 is a great year for you all.